okay sir uh, we are starting then good evening everyone today uh, you all know professor siddharth loskar sir is with us and uh, i don't need to introduce sir he is one of the most respected and most beloved teacher and i remember from uh, my old posting in tms that all the residents actually used to wait for his posting when that posting will come so i think that uh, same culture is still there people still wait for posting with sir and sir is mainly taking up uh, taking care of pediatrics uh, hematological malignancies sarcomas and definitely we should not forget his passion for brachytherapy so uh, when i requested sir for take to take this class about rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma and uh, actually i requested him to take two classes he actually readily agreed to take those two classes and one we are having today another one we will have tomorrow so today we are having the class on rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma and tomorrow we will have on avian sarcoma although i have uh, posted this topic like this risk stratification management and target value i know uh, Uh, sir will definitely modify this according to the requirement of the students and what what he feels best and um, i request sir to please uh, take over the session and start the class thank you so much sir thanks thanks dodo thanks for opening uh i think i hope it will be useful for you and uh, so can i share my screen dodo yes sir please uh you have disabled attendee screen, uh, screen sharing sir i have enabled that please enabled. share it once no you have to do it again probably sir can you try once again because i have enabled share screen option okay i am actually not getting it but i will try again yes sir please yeah now it's come yeah thank you sir yes so hopefully you can see my screen yes sir so good evening everyone hope you are all doing well and nice and fit and uh, dodul i kept the same title as thank you, you sir <laughs> thank you sir i yes i i realize <laughs> that you have a specific interest in this so i will definitely touch upon uh, risk stratification management and target volume it's more or less everything of rhabdomyosarcoma except chemotherapy so i i know that it will be one hour and i'll try to finish before that so that we have a little bit of time to discuss um so let me start yeah you can see my slides moving yes sir so so just a little bit of a background before we really go into the management and the nitty gritty of managing rhabdomyosarcomas these are relatively um, rare tumors compared to the tumors that you have been discussing in the previous uh, month or so and because there are rare tumors um, the guidelines are also not very robust and uh, they are all based on experiences from some cooperative groups and uh, single arm studies so the other important thing that you can see from this slide is that uh, people who are affected by this tumor are generally very young and as you know there is an implication of that and that is with regard to the late effects of treatment that you can have in these young people of course you can see these uh, tumors in slightly older also but most of them would be less than 25 to 30 years of age now uh, the locations where you can have rhabdomyosarcomas the commonest site is in the head and neck region and then followed by the genito urinary uh, sites and then followed by the other sites which are smaller in number so the primary location of involvement of rhabdomyosarcomas is in the head and neck region and in the genito urinary region now this is uh, some information on the risk factors we really don't have 
specified risk, risk factors like smoking and lung cancer and things like that. But uh, there are certain things that have been implicated to be related uh, to development of rhabdomyosarcomas. And you can see them here. Uh, there are certain uh, syndromes that are involved. There are some congenital disorders that are involved. But these are more of theory that you should remember rather than for practical applications. Now, this is an important slide that uh, people treating rhabdomyosarcomas should remember. And this is a very basic slide. Was it, what does it really tell you? It tells you that the natural history of rhabdomyosarcomas varies and is influenced by the site of development, the age of diagnosis, and the histological type. So like many other tumors, the natural history is actually influenced by these uh, various factors. So say so for example, if you look at urinary bladder and vagina, normally you would find these tumors uh, in very young children. And there is a specific histological type that you see, which is the embryonal and botryoid subtype. Right? This has a prognostic implication. Similarly, for lesions involving the trunk and extremities, you would normally see them in adolescents. And the histological subtype there is generally a more unfavorable histological type, which is alveolar or undifferentiated. The rest of the tumors in the head and neck region are generally of the embryonal subtype. So you can see that, you know, based on the location and, and uh, the age of the patient, the natural history would vary. Now, are they infiltrating? Are they pushing? Yes, they do push, but unlike regular soft tissue sarcomas, they also have an invasive component. So they do form a pseudo capsule, but they are locally invasive. And that has an implication when you are actually defining your margins or you're taking your margins. Local spread, like any other soft tissue sarcomas, is facial or along the muscle planes. This is important. Unlike the non rhabdo soft tissue sarcomas, the lymphatic extensions are seen in almost about 15 to 20 percent of patients. And it has a predilection uh, for certain subsites where the lymph nodal involvement could be higher in the range of 25 percent, as you can see there in the paratesticular region, in the extremities and in truncal tumors, whereas it is very little in the orbit. That is obviously because of the lymphatics that you have in these regions. Again, hematogenous dissemination is seen at presentation in almost about 15 to 20 percent of patients. And generally, you would have distant metastasis involving lung, bone marrow, bone, and also in the abdomen. Certain histological subtypes like alveolar subtype has a higher incidence of distant metastasis compared to the embryonal subtype. So that's a brief about the natural history, how the tumor uh, grows, how it uh, spreads. So what are the clinical features? As a, as a person in the clinic, we need to know what a patient with rhabdomyosarcoma could present as in the clinics. Many a times they would just present with a asymptomatic soft tissue mass, uh, slowly growing in size over a period of time. And the other specific symptoms that you can see would be based on where the disease is located. Orbit is a very common site of disease involvement and many of them would present with proptosis, ophthalmoplasia. If there is intracranial extension, a paramenial disease, you could have uh, cranial nerve palsies, head and neck, uh, uh, headache, and uh, nasal obstruction and anosmia and parosmia. So similarly, for other sites, you would have symptoms that are related to where the disease is involving. Commonly, you could see lymph nodal involvement. And as I said, almost 20, 25% of patients could have hematogenous metastasis at presentation and the symptoms could be related to what site the disease is involving. Now, once you have evaluated a patient in the clinic, um, you have a suspicion that it is a rhabdomyosarcoma, then you need to do some specific uh, evaluation and examinations and investigations. So what are these? As a student, we need to know what these you know, basic things are. Obviously, history and physical examination is extremely important for uh, determining what it could be. 
and uh, also direct our investigations accordingly. Hemogram, we all know it has to be done because uh, these patients may have bone marrow involvement and you will also have to do chemotherapy and radiation therapy with or without surgery for these patients. Bone marrow aspiration needs to be done for all patients. Imaging, imaging is important. Um, uh, you can have lung involvement, you can have marrow involvement, you can have bone involvement. And of course, the primary disease also needs to be evaluated. So uh, the appropriate imaging, of course, three-dimensional imaging has to be chosen. CECT scan of th uh, the thorax is important to evaluate pulmonary metastasis. MRI of the primary site is very commonly used. People do a little bit of debate regarding a PET CT scan as a one-stop shop investigation. I will tell you a little bit more about a PET CT scan and whether it scores above MRI and CECT scan or not. Based on whether you're doing head and neck, uh, primary site, genitourinary, or extremity or trunk, the relevant investigation could change and you are pretty much aware about it. Now I mentioned about PET CT scan. Now, is PET CT scan better than a CE CT scan uh, or an MRI or a bone scan? Now, this was an interesting study uh, done by the group from uh, St. Jude Children's Hospital, Matthew Craze and Sherry Spunt and group, where they labeled conventional imaging as a combination of CT of the thorax, a CT or MRI of the primary, and a bone scan. And they compared the uh, pickup rates uh, against a PET CT scan. And what they concluded from this uh, evaluation or survey was that PET CT scan better detected nodes, bone marrow, bone, and soft tissue extent of disease. So PET CT scan seems to be you know, uh, getting popular in terms of a one-stop shop investigation for uh, uh, rhabdomyosarcoma staging and prognostication. There were some slides on prognostication uh, using PET CT scan and they show quite a lot of promise. I'm not going to touch upon that in the interest of time. So we've evaluated the patient uh, in the clinic. We have done investigations and now we need to know a little bit more about the pathology and how do we prognosticate and how do we look at the staging. So all of us know about the international classification of rhabdomyosarcoma. And this classification primarily divides the histological subtypes based on the prognosis they impart to the patient. So in the superior prognosis, botryoid rhabdomyosarcoma and spindle cell rhabdomyosarcoma with five-year survivals in the range of 80 to 90, 85 to 90%, 95%. Embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma is again good prognosis. It's taken as intermediate prognosis with a survival of uh, 80 to 85. And then we have the ones with poor prognosis, uh, which is of a lot of clinical significance. We have the alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, the undifferentiated rhabdomyosarcoma, anaplastic rhabdomyosarcoma. And there's the last group of rhabdomyosarcoma with rhabdoid features, which has the worst prognosis. So these are the broad types, and especially for the, for the students, you need to remember the good prognosis, which is the embryonal subtype, and the slightly poorer prognosis, which is the alveolar subtype. These are the commonest ones that we will en encounter in your clinics. You need to also know a little bit about uh, the uh, molecular uh, thing. This is because uh, there is prognostic implication of these uh, factors. Now, if you have to differentiate between embryonal and alveolar subtype, uh, these are all the small round blue cell tumors and most of them would be positive for actin, myosin, desmin, and myoD1. And myoD1 is supposed to be very specific for a rhabdomyosarcoma. And uh, clinicians, as clinicians, we know we need to differentiate between embryonal and alveolar subtypes. And what we know is that almost 80% of uh, patients with alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma would have a translocation in the name of PAX3 FKHR or PAX7 FKHR translocation, most of them would have. The ones who don't have the, the rap, alveolar rhabdomyosarcomas that don't have this translocation behave pretty similar to embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, and I'll tell you the clinical implication in some later slides. 
So that's about the histological subtype that you need to know when you are treating rhabdomyosarcomas. So how do you stage them and how do you prognosticate them? The basic staging system for rhabdomyosarcoma came from the intergroup rhabdomyosarcoma studies and which started in 1972. And then later on, we also had the TNM staging system. And now we have included other factors which have prognostic significance. And now we have reached a point where we use clinical group, TNM staging, other prognostic factors to finally arrive at a risk stratification for, for the treatment point of view. So what does the intergroup IRS clinical grouping show? So you just need to remember that there are four groups here. And uh, in the group one, broadly, it is the disease that is localized and it is completely resected. So if you have a patient who comes with a tumor, which may be small or large, you will localize to one region and you are able to operate and remove it completely, it would be labeled as a group one uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. A group two, broadly is a tumor that is resected, but you have microscopic disease left behind, or you had regional lymph nodes which were resected. So that's group two. Group three are the ones where you are unable to operate and remove the tumor completely, or you had to give chemotherapy upfront, following which your surgery, uh, you had a surgery where you remove the tumor completely or incompletely. These would classify as group three, and of course, like any other site, a group four would be the ones with metastatic disease. So one localized completely removed, two localized uh, microscopic disease residual, three inoperable or residual disease, four metastatic disease. That's the simple way of remembering the grouping. This still applies, although we have gone on to risk stratification using other factors, but this still is very important. Now, what people understood uh, about uh, the natural history of rhabdomyosarcoma is that certain sites have better prognostic outcomes. And as you can see from this graph, orbit seems to be doing the best, followed by GU, then head and neck, then GU, bladder, prostate, parameningeal head and neck, and extremities seem to be doing the worst. Although from the treatment point of view, the extremities probably could be the easiest to treat and the orbit and the head and neck region would be the most difficult, but because of the histology, because of how they present and spread, the prognostic implication of site orbit seems to be doing the best. So this is something we knew later on as we went on. And that is why the site was also included as one of the uh, factors to define whether the patient is in stage one, two, three versus four. In terms of T size, T size, less than five centimeter and more than five centimeter nodes involved and uninvolved and M was of course metastasis present or absent. The other thing that was also found later on was that children generally did better than adults. If you see, look at the graph uh, below, you would find that the uh, children were doing better than the adults. So this was also defined as one of the prognostic factors that determined outcome. So like any other good staging system, the staging system should be able to tell you whether a particular patient would do well in the future or the patient would not do as well. And that is why as we understood more and more about the factors that define the outcome in a particular patient, these were all incorporated into one system called the risk stratification from the treatment point of view. And what did we include in the risk stratification? We included the clinical grouping. We included TNM staging. We included histology because the good histologies do well and the poor histologies don't do as well. And we also included age as a uh, risk stratification factor. So based on that, finally, when you're in a clinic, we have done your physical examination, your investigations, you would finally, before you start your treatment, you would reach to uh, a diagram like this, where you would label them into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. Now, from the radiation point of view, it doesn't really matter too much. But uh, from the chemotherapy point of view, yes, low, intermediate, and, risk, and high risk, there is a difference in the treatment that we, one would offer. So as, I, as you can see in the labels there, 
the low risk are the ones with TNM stage one, embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, and clinical grade uh, groups one, two, and three. And similarly for TNM stage two, two and three, embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. So this would go into low risk. Similarly, you can see those for intermediate and high risk rhabdomyosarcomas. You can see that TNM stage four or any rhabdomyosarcoma with uh, um, alveolar histological subtype. So once you have done your physical examination, investigations, staging, you need to look at how you're going to treat the patient. So here comes the management and the broad policy of management is to control disease, preserve function and minimize morbidity. And this is achieved with the best combination and the best sequencing of chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery in the best possible manner. We are still struggling to find out the best combination, the best intensity, best doses, and the best volume. But generally, that is the broad policy for deciding what the best treatment for this patient or for the patients would be. Now, since this is more to do with radiation, I would uh, want uh, most of the students to at least understand at the end of the seminar, uh, what the indications of radiotherapy are, when should we do radiotherapy and why, uh, what is the optimal dose of radiation therapy, what is the target volume that Todul specifically wanted to know, uh, is there a role of de-escalating radiotherapy doses, is there a role of de-escalating treatment itself, how about hyperfractionated radiation therapy, what about avoiding radiation therapy in a particular group of young patients? As I said in the first slide, these, uh, most of them would be less than five years of age, and they are obviously prone to the late effects of chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery. So if you can avoid a particular kind of treatment, it is good. And of course, finally, what are the best techniques for delivering radiotherapy for rhabdomyosarcoma? So now in one slide, can we define what is the uh, indication of radiotherapy? So uh, if you see here, obviously all patients with unresectable primary disease at diagnosis, which uh, amounts to a group three, that means all IRS group three tumors, irrespective of what histological type, the favorable or unfavorable, would require radiation therapy. Patients with microscopic disease, that is group two, and patients with completely resected alveolar histological, that's the poorer histological subtype, you would give radiation therapy. Now, these are the situations where you do def, uh, curative, uh, with a curative intent. Of course, there is a definite role of radiotherapy in palliation, but I'm now referring to uh, the situations where you're treating uh, the patient with a, with a curative intent. So the, so the next thing is, uh, when should we really start the radiation therapy? Now, there have been multiple, uh, there are no randomized trials to look at whether starting radiation therapy soon or later helps or uh, uh, in improving outcomes. But from whatever data we have, uh, we have certain uh, guidelines to help us in deciding when should we start radiation therapy. And they are quite logical. If a patient has intracranial extension, base skull erosion, or cranial nerve palsies, you need to start radiation upfront. And that is simply because the chances of disease disseminating in the CNS is higher uh, when uh, you have disease in these areas. So you need to start radiotherapy early. Then you have those tumors that are close to the base skull and the areas where the disease can disseminate, which are the paramenangeal areas in immunity. You need to know the names of these sites uh, which are included in the paramenangeal site. In them, radiation therapy should be started after week three. Uh, that means you've just started chemotherapy and week three you start. And for all the remaining, you would allow the intensive chemotherapy or the induction chemotherapy to get over and then evaluate for the local therapy, which is either in the form of surgery or radiation therapy or a combination of surgery and radiation therapy. So what you need to remember is day zero, week three, and week nine normally. 
So this was uh, one study uh, from the uh, IRS uh, trials, uh, IRS 2 to 4, and Jeff Mikalski had reported this. And basically they reported on the impact of delaying radiation therapy. So what was seen is that in a subset of patients like bladder and prostate, uh, these were generally very young kids. In them, delaying radiation therapy did not really impact on the overall survival. But if you had diseases in the meningeal uh, region or parameningeal region, the delay of radiation therapy had a significant impact on local relapse of disease. So in the head and neck region, you have to be really cautious. If for some reason you have to delay uh, radiation therapy, you could possibly delay radiation therapy in sites like bladder and prostate. The other question that uh, sometimes comes is, uh, can we avoid radiation therapy altogether? Because these are young patients. And of course, there will be side effects of treatment. So if you have good response to chemotherapy, can we just avoid radiation therapy? Now, there are no head-to-head um, -head comparisons of radiation therapy versus no radiation therapy. But uh, some data there available from the malignant mesenchymal tumor studies of PSYOP 89 and 95. Broadly, what one found in these studies was that children less than three years in these MMT trials who were not given radiation therapy because they were young had a almost 20% inferior overall survival compared to the ones who did receive radiation therapy. So in your clinic, if you have a face a situation where you are debating whether you should do or not, you should remember that uh, while you're deciding on to give or not to give radiation therapy, you need to keep that in mind that the outcomes are definitely inferior when you avoided radiation therapy for whatever reason. Now, there is a more recent study that came just in February. Again, now we said that all alveolar histologies should radiation, receive radiation therapy, but uh, the children's oncology group actually wanted to evaluate and see from their four or three trials, the D9602, D9803, and the ARST study. Uh, they wanted to see if we had a complete excision of uh, tumor, uh, alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, would we avoid giving radiation therapy? So what they really found was that local failure rates when you received radiation therapy was about 4.9%. And the local failure rates when you did not give radiation therapy was 34. So there was almost a 30% increase in the local recurrence rates. But what was interesting is that, and that is why we need to know about the PAX3 and PAX7 FKHR translocation, the FOXO translocation. So there, the ones that were negative for PAX3 and PAX7 FKHR, the alveolar abdomyosarcomas, they, in them, you gave or did not give radiation therapy, did not have a significant impact. That means the PAX3 and PAX7 negative alveolar rhabdomyosarcomas behaved almost similar to embryonal rhabdomyosarcomas. So this concept they are evaluating in the currently ongoing ARST1-1431 trial of the children's oncology group. So we don't have the answer to that right now. But what we know is if the translocation is negative, so translocation negative alveolar abdomyosarcomas behave pretty similar and they should be treated something similar to embryonal abdomyosarcomas. The other thing that uh, people talk about is, you know, these children with vaginal rhabdomyosarcomas, they are generally very young. And these young children giving radiation therapy to the perineal region, uh, the, the toxicity is pretty high. And there have been attempts to reduce uh, or uh, avoid the use of radiation therapy. And again, what was found was that avoidance of radiation therapy in these patients, especially when the cyclophosphamide dose was not uh, optimal, the outcomes were inferior. So both in paramenangeal and in perineal and, and vaginal rhabdomyosarcomas in very young children, avoiding radiation therapy should be done with extreme caution. Now, 
these are uh, from the okay. uh, these are I adapted this on the web for when the cycle of my doors was not um, so so these are actually from the cog uh, guidelines regarding the target volumes now we know when to give radiation therapy we know when not to give radiation therapy now when you decide to give radiation therapy how do you plan your radiation therapy like any other site uh, you have your standard gtv ctv and ptv now there is something important that all of you should remember now gtv as you know based on the imaging and the clinical examination and other investigations you define what is the gross extent of disease so so that's very simple to remember and that the cog has defined as gtv1 that means at the primary time now when you have a surgery or chemotherapy that has been done and you and after that when you do your imaging if you have something residual gross that is that in the cog guidelines has been labeled, labeled as gtv2 and there is a implication of gtv1 and gtv2 so gtv is pretty simple now what is important is ctv now please do not grow a ctv it you should always draw a ctv now there is a difference if you've drawn your gtv1 and you grow a margin of 0.5 to 1 cm it may not include the areas of possible extension of microscopic disease so you should not be growing a ctv you should be drawing a ctv based on your imaging findings and well, that's ctv1 and similarly like gtv2 that means after surgery or chemotherapy similarly ctv also has a ctv2 which is post surgery or post chemotherapy what i would suggest is that you just remember gtv and ctv and don't complicate get complicated uh, into ctv1 and ctv2 and we'll talk about it later on and of course ptv uh, it all depends on uh, what location you are treating and also depends on what your institutional policies are and the way that you are immobilizing your patient and what kind of technique of treatment that you are using so generally what the cog uses is the is a ptv margin of 0.5 cm and this the other part about whole lung radiation and whole abdominal radiation this is just uh, what the cog has included in this uh, prescription whole lung radiation uh, we have to remember that it is not as frequently used and, and the data for its use is not as robust as in wilms tumor or ewing sarcomas although in some patients where you have lung metastasis and the primary has been uh, treated well and the lung lesions reduced uh, and cannot be operated the whole lung radiation has been used in uh, rhabdomyosarcoma also but it is not not as commonly used as in ewing sarcoma and wilms tumor whole abdominal radiation has been used in situations where there is either uh, disseminated abdominal disease at presentation or there is spillage or diffuse spillage of disease during surgery uh, during intra abdominal surgery now generally you would do a whole abdominal radiation followed by a boost to the gross residual disease uh, or the microscopic disease as it, as as applicable so that's about the gtv ctv and ptv now let's look at an example uh, of uh, this patient that we treated in 2017 our orbital rhabdomyosarcoma is very common and we said that the uh, ctv margin can be 0.5 cm and then modify and draw the ctv margins and have a, another margin of 5 mm for the ptv now let us see this patient uh, who had a orbital rhabdomyosarcoma and we gave chemotherapy with uh, good clinical response and obviously we had to do radiation now this is the tumor that you can see involving the right orbit it is pressing on the globe obviously there is no extension within the globe it was coming anteriorly and so it's more of the anteromedial kind of disease now this is the original extent of disease now based on our 
uh, description of what is a GTV and CTV. Now you can see it here. I want you to look at it a, a bit carefully. Now this is the CTV that is residual. And I don't, I don't know whether you can actually appreciate the magenta colored CTV here. So it's pretty close. The CTV should not be coming here because it is not going within the globe. So it is pressing on the globe, so it remains here. And the CTV should not go beyond the bony wall here because there is no microscopic disease going into the ethmoid air cells here. Neither is the CTV going beyond the thermoplastic mold here, so we are extending it anteriorly. So this is important. We should not be just going by the pretreatment volumes and just draw the CTV on this area and this area. It is reduced now. The CTV remains confined to boundaries, and that is very, very important. And then, of course, you have your PTV that is drawn. Now, this is an example of uh, it's like some more slices. This is the GTV. I've reduced the CTV here because it is, cannot go beyond into the orbit here. This is the, uh, sorry, the eyeball. Again, here near the eyeball, it's pressing on the eyeball. You can see the sclera right there. So we have cut it off here. So that's one thing that you need to remember. At the same time, you should not be reducing the CTV to avoid the pre-treatment or it should not be less than the pre-treatment extent of disease. So this was the outcome uh, after completion of radiation therapy. The disease responded completely. And uh, so, so this is one example of how you should be drawing your GTV, CTV, and PTV. This is another example. Again, it is very interesting in the, in the prostate. Uh, the one on your left is the pre-chemotherapy uh, volume. The red one is the GTV or GTV1. That's the pre-treatment volume. So, and then you have the GTV2. This is the post-treatment. Now, again, if you just draw or grow a CTV by five millimeters, then it'll come only up to here. So please don't grow it. And if you grow it here, it's going to go into the in, anterior to the symphysis pubis. So please don't grow it, you draw it. So that's the CTV that is drawn. So that's the pretreatment and all these, these are the pretreatment volumes. These are the post-treatment volumes. This is GTV1, the red one, and the green one is GTV2. And your purple one is the CTV when we are drawing because you need to include the pretreatment disease extent in your CTV. So it doesn't become GTV plus a few millimeter margin. You have to draw the CTV and spare the structures here. So that is what I wanted to highlight here. The most important thing that you need to remember is that, and like any other site, even head and neck, you don't change the CTV. You can change the GTV and don't grow the CTV, draw the CTV. These are standard uh, OER dose constraints that were, and this was again by the Children's Oncology Group, which they follow. These are pretty similar to the standard guidelines that we have for dose constraints of various structures in the body. Now, what is the uh, optimal dose of radiation therapy? Now we understood that when to give radiation therapy, we understood what timing to give radiation therapy, we understood how to draw the volumes for radiation therapy. Now the question is, what is the right dose for radiation therapy? Now these doses that we recommend for rhabdomyosarcoma is not again based on some randomized clinical trials, but these are based on retrospective analysis of large series. So based on all the series that we have, till now the standard doses for gross disease has been 50.4 gray in 28 fractions at 1.8 gray per fraction. And for microscopic disease, post-operatively, it has been 41.4 gray in 23 fractions at 1.8 gray per fraction. Now, these were the standard dose that have been recommended. Now, people are also exploring uh, reducing doses further and also increasing doses in a group of patients. Now, this was uh, a report from the 
Children's Oncology Group, D9602 study. And what they wanted to look at is, can we reduce the doses of radiation to 36 gray for microscopic disease? As you can see, there are stage uh, group 2A, they intended to reduce to 36 gray. And what was seen is that if you reduce the dose to 36 gray, your chemotherapy needed to be good. What is the difference in the chemotherapy? What they found was that patients who received 36 gray and did not have cyclophosphamide in the chemotherapy, the outcomes were poorer. The local failure rates, as you can see there, was 15%. Whereas the ones who received chemotherapy, uh, received cyclophosphamide, and the, when you gave a 36 gray dose, the our local failures were zero. So the lesson that we know from here is that for orbital rhabdomyosarcomas or a favorable uh, site rhabdomyosarcoma, if you are thinking of reducing the dose of radiation therapy, you need to ensure that you have the right chemotherapy being given. So that was the broad message that came from the COG 9602 trial that be careful when you are wanting to reduce the dose for microscopic disease to less than 41.4 gray. So we, we, we now know that the standard dose of radiation therapy for gross disease is 50.4 gray, for microscopic disease is 41.4 gray, and if you're doing appropriate chemotherapy with the right doses of cyclophosphamide, for the favorable prognostic group, you can reduce the dose to 36 gray of radiation therapy. The other question is, can we, do we need to escalate doses? We really don't have data. Currently, there is a COG study that is ongoing, which is looking at increasing the dose of radiation above 50 gray in patients who've got large gross disease, more than five centimeter in size, and they are currently evaluating that in a COG study. Um, about hyperfractionation, again, there are just one or two studies where they looked at whether hyperfractionation improves uh, outcomes. There was obviously no difference in the disease control because the doses were not really very different between the two arms of 59.4 gray um, versus 50.4 gray and 1.8 gray per fraction. And there was no difference in the local regional control, freedom from relapse and uh, failure-free survival and overall survival. So hyperfractionation did not really change and uh, change the outcomes. So another thing that we need to remember as uh, people managing rhabdomyosarcomas is what is the significance of lymph nodal involvement? Now, should we do a lymph nodal dissection or not do a lymph nodal dissection? If you did not do a lymph node dissection, do we need to radiate that area or not radiate that area? And we, which are the patients where you should be doing a lymph nodal dissection? Now, these are important questions that you need to answer when you are in the clinic. So for paratesticular abdomyosarcomas, where you have the highest incidence of lymph nodal metastasis, this was a SEER data which is a relatively large group. What they found was that patients aged uh, 10 years or, ab or, or above uh, with lymph nodal dissection, the survival improved, the overall survival improved from 64% to 86%. Whereas patients who are younger than 10 years of age, in them, it was not really necessary uh, to do a lymph nodal dissection. So, that is one factor that you need to remember when you are actually treating patients. And the addition of radiation therapy improved the five-year overall survival in patients who had positive lymph nodes. So if you have positive lymph nodes, you need to add radiation therapy, 41.4 gray in 23 fractions. So coming down to the RT techniques now, does it make a difference using you know, conformal techniques, proton therapy, brachytherapy? So as students of radiotherapy, we obviously know you don't have to be told that uh, conformal radiotherapy potentially should be reducing the toxicity of treatment because of spare, better sparing of normal tissues. 
Now, this was a study uh, a report, not even a study. It was a report from the uh, group from Memorial Sloan Kettering, where they reduced uh, the margins, the CTV margins, uh, using IMRT. And this is what they reported. The bottom line is that the, the outcomes were good and the toxicities were pretty similar to what they found in the non-IGRT study era. So it was not a huge difference, but maybe there was a little difference in the, um, I, uh, there is little improvement in the IMRT arm in terms of outcomes. So this is again another study from the, I think the group from MD Anderson and Baylor. The control rates in paramenangeals were inferior compared to the non-paramenangeal sites but the overall local controls were extremely good in the head and neck region. Again, another study comparing 3D CRT and IMRT. Uh, if you look at the clinical outcomes, there is nothing much to choose between the, these two techniques, but I guess it will be foolish to try and do 3D CRT in these patients and not do IMRT because uh, the amount of effort that you would put in would be more or less the same. What about proton therapy? Yes, um, we know that proton therapy, uh, the broad and the only advantage of proton therapy is that it has a sharp fall off of dose beyond the target. And uh, it does result in a superior dose distribution. And because of that, you would be able to spare the normal tissues better. And this may help you in escalating doses and probably improving local controls and reducing the toxicity of treatment. So do we have clinical outcomes? Uh, there are some dosimetric studies, obviously that has come from Mass General Hospital. And, uh, uh, and what they broadly report is that the ability to spare the normal tissues seems to be better with protons, but we still don't have long-term clinical outcomes data which says that the disease control is actually better and clinical proof of the toxicity is being less. Dosimetrically, Proton beam seems to be much better than IMRT. This is another study for uh, orbital rhabdomyosarcomas comparing protons and X-rays. And what is generally seen is that the ability to spare the retina is almost about 20% greater with protons compared to X-rays for the same patients. Optic nerve sparing 23%, orbital bone 29%. So there seems to be a significant sparing of normal tissue when you compare with x-rays. And we have some clinical outcomes data from uh, the Mass General Hospital. This again shows that there is some improvement in the toxicity profile when you're using proton beam therapy compared to uh, x-ray therapy uh, and IMRT, uh, 3D CRT and IMRT. But we still do not have large long-term data available. So again, this is a phase two trial of proton in pediatric rhabdomyosarcomas from the European group. The outcomes seem to be extremely good and the late effects of uh, treatment are again reduced to a significant extent compared to what you would see with the photon therapy. Although these are non-randomized data that is available. And this is one of the most recent data that is available uh, from the, again, from the group from MD Anderson and the US uh, Proton uh, group. So broadly, when you look at the uh, disease control, they seem to be pretty good. But what is important here is that there are no marginal failures. So people are generally worried when you are actually reducing margins, tight margins, conformal treatments. So there were no marginal failures. And, and compared to the conventional IMRT, series, there seemed to be a reduction in toxicity. So there seems to be some data coming regarding reduction of toxicity with proton beam therapy. So, so to summarize, um, radiation, as you see, is actually used in a significant as a significant uh, treatment and a large number of patients with rhabdomyosarcoma. It does show evidence in improving local disease control also translating to overall survival benefit in some high-risk patients. Conformal techniques seem to be improving outcomes and also seem to be reducing toxicity. And we need to be really careful when we are trying to
tailor our therapy in terms of reducing the doses of radiation and also trying to avoid radiation therapy in a particular group of patients. So I think I just covered uh, the natural history staging, the investigations, uh, volumes, doses, when to avoid, when not to avoid the techniques of radiation therapy and uh, what the newer radiation therapy techniques actually do uh, in terms of disease control and reducing toxicity in rhabdomyosarcomas. I hope I have not really gone past. Yes, we have probably five minutes more. And I will be happy to take some questions from you all if you have some queries. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank uh, you, Dodo. This is pretty extensive, and uh, I think whatever I wanted, you have covered everything. Yeah, with I did. Some, with, some additional, with some additional margin. Yeah. So, so, I, so if you. Yes, sir. Please. Sir, please tell me. So, if there are any questions, so I yes, will... uh, yeah. there are a couple of questions in the chat box. Okay. Uh, so, the first one is from Dr. Nilesh Mani. Yeah. Uh, do adaptive treatment is uh, is adaptive treatment required in orbital RMS? Absolutely. So, yes, definitely required. Uh, uh, and uh, if you are treating orbital rhabdomyosarcoma with definitive RT. Generally, you would be treating a large volume uh, tumor. And since they are so sensitive to radiation, they would regress in size as your treatment goes on. And uh, you need to do adaptive. So if you ask me, when do we do adaptive? The answer is when you see that there is a significant reduction in the tumor size. If you ask me, can you do at day 15 or day 20? The answer is we don't know whether in day 15 or day 20, they're going to reduce. So what you need to do is you need to do adaptive, but you need to do adaptive based on how the patient uh, tumor is responding. Yes. Yeah. And one thing that you need to obviously remember, like in head and neck region, please be very careful about the CTV reduction. This, you know, if the towards the body surface, you can cut it off, but please do not reduce the, the CTV one which I showed you right in the beginning. The GTV can change, but the CTV one doesn't change. And in your practice, how do you decide when to do the adaptive treatment? What are the factors you look for? So I only look at the response. I only look at the response. I don't look at anything else. Actually, you should not be looking at anything else either. So if you have a, so when we are planning a patient, say for example, a patient with a, a PNS or a orbital rhabdomyosarcoma with intracranial extension, you're starting RT day zero and you have simulated, you already know that there is a large tumor that you're treating. This patient has not had any chemotherapy till now and radiation till now. So obviously this patient's tumor would regress. So you have to keep an eye on how the tumor is regressing. And if there is a significant regression, you need to evaluate for uh, adaptive planning. So you can do your planning and see if there's a significant change in the dose distribution, you go on to the second or the new plan. So you may ask me after what percentage reduction would you suggest adaptive? Because that percentage reduction would depend on how the tumor is located, how large the tumor is, and how much is it impacting on the dosimetry. So uh, there is no value of a percentage reduction that would, you know, uh, push you to do adapt a new adaptive plan. So keep an eye and you would see a lot of changes in the volumes and you do have to do adaptive uh, planning in these patients. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Dr. Kostov. Should we fuse pretreatment CT with planning CT to draw the CTV? So pretreatment CT with planning CT, yes. We frequently use a PET CT scan as a in the staging evaluation for our patients. And we do use the pretreatment uh, CT scan to draw our uh, CTV uh, in our planning and the planning CTV. Yes, we do use it because that is very important. If you, if your CTV is less than the extent of disease that you had at presentation, you are uh, at risk of having a marginal relapse. So yes, uh, should you fuse? The answer is yes, you should be fusing it if possible. 
but you have to be careful because the fusion is not very very accurate so you have to take a balanced view on when you're fusing the next question is from dr ajay can gtb and ctb be the be same in intraocular tumors without infiltration yes it can be so the example that i showed you now there was a very little difference between the gtb and ctb and even if you look at the you know the cog guidelines which uh, you will see in these slides they said that if there is no reduction in the size of tumor after the thing that so the gtb can be actually more or less similar to ctb especially in areas where you, it is bounded by uh, bones say for example in the medial uh, 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 part of the orbit which is surrounded on one side by the bony orbit on the other side by the sclera above by the bony orbit again and below again by the bony orbit so if something like that you see there will be hardly any difference between uh, gtv and ctv and in here it is any skin so you obviously you can't have ctv in air thank you sir the next question is from dr neha patel how to decrease recurrence rate in paramaningeal rms what precautions should be taken a um, fantastic question um two three things one uh, when you are imaging uh, you obviously should use the right imaging modality and nobody today would be using uh, you know doing a treatment planning scan without having a baseline three dimensional imaging so you can't have a x ray of the skull and then go ahead and do a treatment planning and so so basically what i'm trying to say is you have to have a baseline investigation uh, which is appropriate um, it is not really necessary to have a mri if you have the mri for the primary site it is good it gives you a better indication of where the disease is extending especially in the orbit um the prostate uh, these areas uh, depending on what location you are doing so use the right imaging as a baseline and if you can use fusion be careful when you are drawing your ctv so spend the maximum time on drawing the right ctv then you would reduce the uh, failures and of course you know when you are having diseases close to the uh, in the paramaningeal sites you are supposed to cover those areas where you could have disease extending into various foramina thank you sir the next question another interesting one dr prashant uh, has asked the role of nodal radiation in hernia carpus yes so uh, there is no role of prophylactic radiation of nodal region but if you have nodal involvement at presentation say for example you have a uh, Uh, maxillary rhabdomyosarcoma with uh, disease involving the preauricular node or say for example you have a floor of mouth rhabdomyosarcoma with a, a right cervical lymph node you need to include in the lymph nodal region in your uh, ctv so you have to treat but say for example you have a maxillary rhabdomyosarcoma and you don't have uh, cervical lymph node involvement in them you need not be need not treat the cervical lymph node so if there is involved you need to treat if it is not involved you need not treat thank you sir next question from dr manish can we go for bone scan in place of bone marrow biopsy no so bone bone scan is an investigation that actually tells you about bone involvement and uh, bone marrow biopsy tells you about bone marrow involvement so the involvement of bone and involvement of bone marrow are two different thing and the bone scan will never tell you whether the bone marrow is involved or not thank you sir Dr. so people are actually trying to use so i'm sorry dodol people yes, are actually trying to use pet ct scan to look at the involvement of bone marrow and that is why pet ct scan seems to be getting more and more popular in the staging investigation and response evaluation in prognostic investigation so for rhabdos because bone uh, pet ct scan seems to be giving some information in ewing sarcoma we have actually given up doing bone marrow aspiration and biopsy sir so is there a, a response assessment system like we have in lymphoma for rms no uh, we we uh, we don't have uh, you you are talking in that uh, like dual scoring system do we have sim something similar in oh no no there is none like that we just look at you know what is the reduction in size but there is nothing like dual 1 dual 2 dual 5 
and one, two, three is negative and four and five is positive. So we really don't have something like that. No. So is there any significance of uh, metabolic response or complete metabolic response in remiss? Yes. So I didn't show you that PET CT scan uh, study. Uh, you know, I, I removed that slide. I thought I would waste time by showing that. Uh, but that shows that the pre-treatment uh, metabolic status of the tumor is actually an important prognostic factor in uh, the uh, defining overall survival. So that's, that's, uh, that has a prognostic significance, yes. The ones who have a higher value does have uh, poorer outcomes compared to the ones who have lower values. That's what it's, I mean, it's not very robust, but that there is a, uh, there is data to say that it helps. Thank you, sir. Dr. Haridas has a question. Is there a concept of whole organ being prophylactically included in CTV in any scenario or site? For abdo, uh, prophylactically treating, not really, no. You would, uh, in rhabdos, you would not prophylactically treat anything. Right. So the next question from Dr. Kunal, any role of brachytherapy in RMS? So there is a lot of role of brachytherapy in RMS. I would have had a one and a half hours class of brachytherapy. Sorry, I wish I, I, I put another class for you on the role of brachytherapy in pediatrics or pediatric tumors. Yes. See, it is, uh, there is a huge role of brachytherapy in rhabdomyosarcoma for all sites. There is a role of brachy in orbit. There is a role of brachy in extremities. There is a role of brachy in chest wall. There is a role of brachy in prostate. There is a role of brachy in ex extremity soft tissue uh, sarcomas. And in my opinion, the role of brachy here in children is actually more than in adults. The reason is, twofold. One, we are more concerned about toxicities in children than in adults. And number two, the volume of tissue that you need to treat or the target volumes are generally smaller uh, uh, in children compared to that in adults. So, um, and that's a huge, huge role of bracket therapy in rhabdomyosarcoma in children. Definitely, there's no doubt about it. I mean, that someday we will have a class on that. Yes, sir. Actually, sir, we, I, I thought to uh, keep that class, but then I, I thought three classes will be too much uh, of pressure or stress for you. No, I'm okay in doing, but the thing is, you know, there are two, three things. Once a class goes more than one hour, it is boring, whatever you do. So it, it's not interesting beyond that, you know, and it's reaching dinner time. So it's... Yes, sir. Right. So there are a lot of questions and I think uh, another 15, 18 questions are there. Mm -hmm. so Don't do it so much. Should, should we yes. continue or I think... Uh, I have finished my dinner, so I'm okay, but... Uh, you people, I don't think we should continue for too long, but I'm, I'm okay to answer. Okay, so then another one or two questions and then we'll finish it. Yeah. The next question was a role of inguinal nodal irradiation in paratesticular and vaginal RMS. Yes. So, yeah, paratesticular RMS, as I said, is a, has high propensity of um, lymph nodal involvement. So, you don't uh, treat the inguinal region be, without evaluating. So here we are talking about a sentinel node biopsy or a proper evaluation of the nodes. So you have to uh, do a radiological investigation of the paraortic lymph nodes, pelvic lymph nodes. If the pelvic and paraortic lymph nodes are negative and there is no evidence of disease there, then you don't really need to do. And similar thing is for the inguinals also. So if you are asking that the inguinal node clinically is negative, on imaging, do we need to treat uh, the inguinal node region in a paratesticular rhabdomyosarcoma? The answer is no. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I will take just another three questions. One yeah. from Dr. Shikha Goel. Yeah. Uh, would you forego bone marrow biopsy for a patient with a negative PET scan? No, not at all. Not at all. Because, but we are probably moving towards that. So we had a similar kind of a situation with Ewing sarcoma, maybe about six years back when we did, uh, when we used to do a bone marrow aspiration biopsy and a, a PET CT scan, and, you know, but slowly, slowly we realized that uh, the accuracy with which you could pick up bone marrow involvement in Ewing's uh, was as good as a bilateral eyelid crest uh, biopsy, bone marrow biopsy. So we've given up. 
but uh, we still don't have uh, very robust data like Ewing's. But I think we are moving towards that. But as of today, I don't think we can, we will avoid doing a bone marrow because of negative PET CT scan. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next one from Dr. Renu Madan. And uh, she told excellent presentation as always, sir. You know, and what is your experience in children less than one year? Um, I just finished a treatment for a bladder rhabdomyosarcoma uh, in a child who was about um, seven months old. Uh, he was from Assam. He just finished three days back. Uh, and we have treated for a few. So some of them I have done brachy as local treatment. But this one, we did external RT. Uh, we were thinking of brachy, but uh, this was a bladder wall. It was a pedunculated kind of a lesion. And the surgeon did a, a, a transurethral resection. And there was nothing really there. So they did not want to open up again. So we did external RT. So this is slightly tricky when you're doing external RT. We put a catheter and indwelling catheter follies uh, during treatment. We just removed it after we finished the treatment because, uh, you know, uh, the irritation of the bladder wall and the inflammation can cause problems uh, like retention and um, uh, frequency and burning and all kinds of things. So we did. So, yes, uh, you have to be careful. But uh, with small volumes, uh, you can still do. But you have to be careful. I mean, very tight margins. Very, very tight margins. Thank you, sir. And the last question uh, from Dr. Arun Kumar Bharma. What maximum dose can be accepted for cervical spinal cord when treating gross tumor close proximity to cord? Gross tumor. I uh, would, I've done uh, for rhabdos, most of them uh, we would have done 50.4 gray in 28 fractions because we don't want to uh, go beyond that. So I'm generally okay. I've actually gone to 55 gray in some patients, yeah. not on rhabdo, but for U wings in the cervical cord. So if you're, uh, yeah, if you're asking me what is the maximum dose that you can go to, I'm okay with about 50, 55 gray in very young kids also. But they will obviously have, even if you give 15 to 20 gray, you'll have a problem. But if you are wanting to cure disease, you, have, you would have already explained to them that there is, this is expected. So it should not happen that you're given 30 gray of radiation, thinking that you will reduce the morbidity, but you neither avoid the morbidity nor you control the disease. So you might as well go ahead and give proper dose of radiation, assuming that you will have problems in the long run and keep your volumes as small as possible. But 55 in peanuts have gone, and anyway in rhabdos, 50.4 is the maximum dose that we normally do. The second part of the question is, since proton therapy is available in India now, should we discuss it in clinic before accepting pediatric patient for photon-based radiotherapy? Any medical implication? No, I, I think you can always discuss. Why not? I mean, uh, you don't discuss between 3D CRT and, 3D -CRT and IMRT. You don't discuss it in uh, IMRT in brachytherapy. So why should you not discuss about proton therapy? You should. But the catch is that when you're discussing these things, you better be sure that you are completely informed regarding the good things and bad things about proton therapy or the other therapies that you are suggesting. So, so the, the person will actually base their decisions based on what information you give you. So a lot of uh, the decisions that the relatives would take or what goes on in their mind would be based on what you tell them. So whoever is discussing, um, ideally, ideally, we should remove all other biases when we are discussing these things in terms of you know, finances, pressures from the administration and things like that. And uh, if possible, I would suggest that you should talk science. So if you're talking science, why not? I mean, you can talk, you should discuss. But at this, I mean, you, when I say you should be well informed, you should be aware of studies. We should be aware of the downsides of protons also. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, thanks. And thank you once again on behalf of everyone participating in this talk. And uh, I'll be waiting for your next class tomorrow in the same time, sir. Okay. So not, actually, we all will be waiting for your class. So thank you so much. I mean, I'll be happy to do that uh, tomorrow. We actually have our 
practicum tmh practicum tomorrow so uh, i'll uh, i was hoping that you'll say that we don't want it tomorrow and we'll want it next week but it's all right <laughs> thank you sir yeah good I, evening for you okay good night sir good night thank you good night,